gentleness. It's not just with our siblings. It's not just with eggs. It's not, I mean, it's with all kinds of things. What is gentleness? It, we can start to pick up here. It is not violent. Okay, it's not violent, so we kind of get some concept. It's not quarrelsome. It's not argumentative. It is not confrontational. Gentleness, what is it? Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 says this, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle towards everyone. So what is gentleness? Well, it's not slandering others. It is considerate of others. Listen to Paul as he addresses the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 10.1. He says, by the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. What's he saying? I I'm coming to you with the kind of gentleness that, that Jesus had. The kind of gentleness that he operated in, I'm coming to you. Well, well was Jesus gentle? Was he gentle? As we ask the question, you might be thinking of that one time where he got so upset in the temple that he grabbed some cord and he made a whip and he chased everybody out of the temple. You guys remember that story, many of you? And so that doesn't seem very gentle. It seems a little, little bit wild. But then again, he didn't take that whip, stick it in his pocket, and just carry it around whipping everybody all the time. There was an appropriate place, an appropriate time where that actually made some sense. Thinking about whether Jesus was gentle or not, he, he called Pharisees snakes. That doesn't sound very gentle. That wasn't a kind word towards them. He called them snakes. But again, he, he didn't go around just calling everybody animals. He didn't go around just giving people bad names and all that. He, he was calling them out because they had refused. They were obstinate towards the truth, and he was calling them out for their abuses of things. Jesus was tough on sin. He was tough on unbelief. But he was also compassionate and gentle towards those in need. He helped uh, by healing lepers. He healed the eyes of the blind. He helped the grieving widow. He restored sanity to the demon-possessed man by removing the demons from his life. Jesus was gentle, but he was not weak. Sometimes when we think of gentleness, we combine that with other words that simply don't connect. Gentleness is not weakness. Jesus was humble, but he was not silent. Gentleness does not mean the person cowering in the back corner who has nothing to say and is afraid. That's not the same concept. So we look at Jesus' life and we begin to understand that gentleness is broader than that, that gentleness does not mean there's never a moment to do or speak strongly. In fact, I would say today that if you express real godly gentleness, it is, a, it is an expression of true strength. To be able to do something and yet choose in the moment control. I have enough power in my body. I'm super strong, guys. You don't even know. I have so much strength, I could just crush an egg. It's crazy. You should see it sometime. But true strength is the ability that I have that ability, but I, but I can choose in the moment to, to care for that egg, to gently crack it in the right place in the right time, those kind of things. That's, that's where we get real power from. When Jesus spoke harshly, it was actually an act of mercy on his behalf. It was kind of roughing people up for the purpose of rescuing them. It was, it was stirring them out of their complacency so that they might come to know true life through him. Even when it seems that Jesus is being harsh, there is an element of gentleness. And so that's the way that Paul comes in his writings in, in the spirit of gentleness of Christ. It's powerful, but yet gentle. It's humble and yet strong. The gentleness of Jesus was connected to, uh, first of all, his mindset towards God. His mindset towards God. Jesus preferred God's plan. That was his mindset. That's what he had in his mind is God's plan, God's will, what God wants. And we see it, Philippians 2, verses 3 through 8, says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, 
not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. And so Jesus' gentleness that he displayed and that he operated in, it began with his mindset towards God. It was a mindset of humility, a mindset of serving God's plan and God's purposes and being in alignment with God. Secondly, his mindset, was, his, his, his um, sorry, his gentleness came from a mindset towards others, which is defined by his mindset towards God. His mindset towards others, their interest rather than his own interest was the focus. This is not selfish. It's not driven by ambition or vanity. It's humility. It's valuing others, not his interests, but theirs. And when, it, when I talk about interests in this sense, it's not whatever they wanted, but Jesus was looking out for what was really truly in their best interest, what was best for them. He was a servant, and he made the choice to be a servant. Your mindset towards God will define your mindset towards others, and it will redefine your mindset towards yourself. Do I need to fight? Do I need to argue? Do I need to yell? Or can I trust God? Can I be a peacemaker? Can I honor him? Can I show gentleness? It has a lot to do with your mindset. And God's word transforms our minds. So what is your mindset today? What has your mindset been this week? What is your general mindset when you're at work? What's your mindset when you're at home? Especially after a long day and the night before you didn't sleep well. What's your mindset? Because life will test us, right? What is our mindset? I'm going to go back to Philippians 4 where Paul tells us again, let your gentleness be evident to all. Evident to all. How's that possible? Well, it's only possible if it's like overwhelmingly there. If it's obvious, it should be clear, it should be strong, it should be evident and, and experienced through your life to all around you. And so all around you, again, that brings us to, to think about our lives really practically in the church. Let your gentleness be known to all in the church. I don't know how many people I've heard express to me over the years that they don't feel like they can be themselves at church because too often when they did express the reality, the truth of who they are, where they've been, what they've done, their real honest thoughts, people were harsh towards them. There was a harshness. There was, a, there, there was a, a group of people or an individual who tried to come over to them with a, with a steel wool brush and clean them up. And so they say, well, I, I have a hard time being open and honest because of my experiences. The question for us today is, are we gentle? As a church, are we gentle? When people come in, no matter what they look like, do they find a gentleness? Do they find a truth that's spoken in love or is it here's the truth now we're going to tear you apart with it we have to be careful we have to submit to god's word so that we can be gentle as the body of christ our world needs gen a gentle church right again gentleness is not uh, sitting in the quarters corner silently cowering no 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 there's a way to be gentle but still speak the truth there's a way to love with honesty. So in the church, it's one of the places we need to think about. How about in your home? Let your gentleness be evident to all in your home. Is gentleness evident in your home? Is it a place of peace? Is it a place that is harsh and abrasive to your spouse, to your children, to your neighbor, I don't know? Or is it a place of, of gentleness? Think about at your workplace. Is your gentleness evident to all in the workplace? 
Do people just lump you in with everyone else that's gossiping and mad and swirling anger all the time and complaining? And, or do you stand out because you have such gentleness? Because the Spirit of God wants to work that into us so that it gets worked through us, so that others see it and it's evident to all. How about at the gym? I mean, I don't know how many people go to the gym, but that's one example. Is your gentleness evident to all at the gym? Do they, do they see and they're like, wow, you just pressed a lot of weight, but you're out of control? Or do they go, wow, you have strength, you have ability, you're, you're disciplined, you're doing this, and you're controlled, you're gentle. You don't lose your top, blow your top, because somebody forgot to wipe the machine after they worked out, you know, whatever. This is real life. I'm trying to get into real life here. Think about it. Is your gentleness evident to all? Or is it a rare occasion? Because the only way it's evident to all is when it's just absolutely, you're saturated in the Spirit of God, walking in obedience with Him, and He's producing this in you. And if it's lacking, well, we're going to talk about some of those things. Philippians 2.14 says, Do everything without grumbling and arguing. All right, I'm going to read that one more time, and I want you to look at me and go, fine, okay? Do everything without grumbling and arguing. I'm glad you agreed. So that, there's a reason for this, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. This is is a powerful little section of scripture right here. Grumbling and arguing is the old way. We are not supposed to do that anymore. We're not perfect yet, so we still do it sometimes, but we should not be embracing it. Grumbling and arguing is the old way, and yet we have, we have crucified that old way, haven't we? We are crucifying the old way. We better pick that cross up again and crucify that old way again because that's the old way. That's the flesh way. We are not to live that way anymore. Amen? Let's embrace it today. Let's accept it because you, your life's not just going to change because you came to church. Your life's going to change when you embrace that Jesus is Lord and his way is best. His way is the way, the only way. We are to shine like stars. Have you ever looked up in a pitch black night and bam, there was a star just shining? That star, it stands out. Why? Because it's different than everything else around it. We are to shine like stars with such gentleness that it's evident to all so that we are not only pure ourselves, but also so that others may see clearly the word of life lived out in front of them. You want to be a witness of Jesus? You want to give a testimony of him and his power and what he can do in people's lives? Live with gentleness. We think about things that would shine, like in the Christian faith. What would shine? Like, uh, what would shine? Maybe an idea is uh, boldly proclaiming a powerful prophetic message, thus saith the Lord. That would shine. That would be a shining moment, right? We think about maybe, maybe a, a praying for someone and, and, and just a miracle happening. Someone that, that, that just couldn't walk and they stand up out of the wheelchair. Like, that would be a shining moment, right? In Jesus' name. And it would be powerful. It would be shining and those, those would be fine. There's lots of shining things that, that you could apply that, that imagery to. But here in God's Word, it's connecting shining to a life of spirit-empowered gentleness. And if you're an introvert and you're a believer in Christ, you should in, internally right now be jumping for joy. Because so many introverts, so many people who are not real super outwardly expressive. They think, well, I can't shine for God because I can't preach. I can't sing. I can't play an instrument. And by the way, pretty much everybody up here almost always is an introvert, but whatever, keep going. So the deal is, though, it's not about getting up front. It's not about being loud. It's not about flexing your spiritual muscles. It's about 
being true, about being genuine, about being gentle. And that is really cool. This points out that we used to be crooked. We used to be twisted. That's the old way, right? The old way was crooked, was twisted. We, and we're not supposed to be like that. No, no, no. We're supposed to shine. There's a different way. Just as the foundation of joy is every, in every circumstance is found in the Lord, it is in the Lord that we are free in every circumstance to be gentle. Think about the last time you blew your top. You were free in Christ to be gentle instead. It was a choice. It was a habit. How do you form a new habit? Repent from the old way and walk in the new way. It's interesting when you start to look at this, and I've thought about this on each one of these of the series. Think about like the Buddhist approach to this. I, I listened to a podcast this week where, where this uh, life coach, Buddhist guy was talking. He was answering the question, so, so what do you do when, you, when you're feeling angry? How do, you, how do you contain that? He said, well, first of all, I just recommend that you pause. That's good advice. That's the same advice I would give. Pause. But in his case, he said, pause and center yourself. In my case, I would say, pause and center yourself on God. It might look very similar, but the foundation is different. Center yourself on God. What pleases God? What does he want? How does he want my interactions with other people to go? Pause. Another recommendation was take a deep breath. That's also really good advice. There's some practical things here that we need to learn, especially if you are known as someone that's not very gentle. You're the, uh, you know, you're the scotch pad. You're, 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 you're the really rough one over there. Then there's some really good advice. That pause and center yourself on God. Begin to practice that. And eventually, you create some new habits that are based upon what pleases God rather than what comes from your natural instinct, which is flesh and sinful and destructive. So, pause. Take a deep breath. Center yourself upon God and God's Word. We're founded, our, our foundation for this is, is in the Lord, and we are free in every circumstance to be gentle, not argumentative, not harsh, not stirring up anger, not accusatory, gentle. Because I do this, I looked up some things on the interwebs this week, and I came across a article that I found was really interesting. I was asking the question, why do toilet paper companies keep reinventing toilet paper? Like you would think, it's a pretty simple thing, and we've done pretty good with this, and yet every time you turn around, there's a new toilet paper. There's another thing added to the toilet paper. I don't know what it used to be like back in the day, but man, there's so many things in the toilet paper today. I mean, you get lotion, you get scented lotions, you can get whatever you want. You can get quilted or you can get, how many plies can you get? Patty and I stayed at someone's house not too long ago and the toilet paper, I swear, was probably like eight ply. I've never seen anything like this. It was crazy. I didn't, we didn't know if it would go down. I mean, it was just like, I don't even know where they bought it. It was some special stuff, okay? This is, we all know, don't pretend you don't use toilet paper, okay? And so I was looking up some information about toilet paper, and, and it, it's, I just find things fascinating. And so I came across this article, NewYorkTimes.com, March 14, 2022, written by Nancy Red. It says this, it's really short. The average American uses an astounding 141 rolls of toilet paper a year. Would you ever imagine that? That is crazy. And uh, okay, keep moving. I'm just, wow. I could, I could get hung up right there for a while. That's a lot of toilet paper. If you're going through that much, that much tissue, we think it's worth settling on a brand you actively like. You could also consider cutting back with the help of a bidet. Thought provoking. Over the course of 10 months, we tushy tested 36 varieties of toilet paper, a 10-month study 
of tushy testing. This is serious stuff. And we concluded that Unilever's seventh generation, 100% recycled, extra soft, and strong bath tissue, and Procter & Gamble's Charmin Ultra Strong, some of you are like, yes, I use that, are the most likely to please the most people. Amazon's Presto, ultra soft toilet paper, our budget pick, is great for folks looking for soft enough toilet paper that costs less. So the question is, why do they keep reinventing it? And the simple answer that I have for us today is, we need more gentleness in our world. Thank you. I have two rolls of toilet paper I'd like to give away today. One of these is a one-ply. One of these is a two-ply quilted. Which one do you want? Two-ply. Some of you are like, I live in an RV. I need the one-ply, right? I'm going to keep the one-ply. Anybody want some two-ply toilet paper? It's not every day I give out. Here we go. It's coming back to you. There you go. Enjoy that toilet paper. Now, I only found one application really for the one-ply. And so I thought I would share it with you. Nora, would you come help me this morning? Real quick, just come on up here. I found one application. Some of you have never seen this, and some others, are, you're having flashbacks. You're like, yeah. All right, here we go. That is the best option for one-ply toilet paper right there. Works really well. Thank you, Nora. Was that fun? She asked for that, just so you know. We don't do this at home as punishment. She asked for that, all right? We were having fun. Oh, boy. What a great time. It's okay to talk about toilet paper in church, just so you know. Let's bring it back, all right? Let's bring it back. There's a connection between joy and gentleness. There's a connection. Last week, and again, just a reminder, we, we talked about joy and how that joy is not dependent upon circumstances. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy that we have is founded, uh, it, it's found in the Lord. It is joy of the Lord that we experience, that we have in every circumstance and can have. And, and, it, and how do we get it? We get it, the Bible tells us, by, by coming to the Lord again and again. We bring our requests to the Lord. We come and give thanks to the Lord. We keep coming back to the Lord. The Lord is where we find our foundation for joy. Gentleness, likewise, it's very much, very much like it. Our ability to be gentle is dependent upon our proximity of our hearts and our minds to God. When I'm focused on myself, I'm not really focused on God and I lose the ability to control myself. But when I'm focused upon the Lord, when I begin to pray, when I come to Him with my request, when I give thanks to Him, when I begin to shift my mind back to Him, my heart back to Him through His Word, through prayer, through gathering, and others encouraging me to do so, then I begin to experience gentleness and joy once again. Is your gentleness lacking? Think about it for yourself, not someone else. Is your gentleness lacking? Check your prayer life. That's the first place I would encourage you to go. Most likely, going to God is not your first resort. So if gentleness is lacking, check your prayer life. The less you rely on God, the more you will lean towards harshness. Why? Because if you're gonna face this harsh world and this harsh life, you know what you have to become if you're gonna do it on your own? You have to become harsh. You have to harden your heart. You have to begin to push people away because you can't do it. You can't make it on your own. You become tough, rough. Your language becomes tough and rough and harsh and accusatory and argumentative. Enough to withstand the harshness of this world, but it doesn't work. When we trust God in His way, because we are intimate with Him, we approach His throne of grace with confidence. We come back to Him again and again, knowing that He is a good Father, 
and we can face each day with gentleness. It's based upon where we've truly planted ourselves. Are we planted in the Lord? And all of a sudden, I don't have to fix everything. You ever feel like you have to fix everything? Stop it. That's not God's plan for your life. When you have to fix everything, it's hard to be gentle. You get too much to do, what do you start doing? You start throwing things around. You crank that wrench harder and you break the bolt off, right? But we find out, I don't have to fix everything. I don't have to control everything. Do you struggle to control everything? Well, you're not supposed to. Trust the Lord and you can sit back and you can be gentle in that moment. We find that I don't have to dominate every conversation or argument. I tell my kids regularly because they just love to argue and we're trying to, we're trying to change that behavior. I said, what does it matter if you win this argument? And they always go, well, it doesn't. I say, okay, then let's practice this. Maybe we can all practice this right now. Come on, look at me right here. Let's practice it. It's my new favorite thing. You say something that I disagree with, but it doesn't really matter, and you're not asking for my thoughts or opinions, I'm gonna go, okay, great. We can have a conversation. I can have thoughts and opinions. If we want to have, that's fine. But I don't need to win every conversation. What I need to do is trust the Lord. He's good. He's faithful. I don't need to win. We find out that I won't get, uh, I won't get caught up in, in grumbling and complaining, adding to the harsh words at my workplace because I can trust God to take care of it. I don't have to dominate, I don't have to win, I don't have to flex my muscles. I, that doesn't mean that I don't speak the truth and if I'm accused of something I didn't do, that I don't share that, but I can share that with gentleness instead of, what, I didn't do that, right? Nobody ever does that. Yeah, we don't have to do that. We can say, reality is that was not me, I didn't do that, um, but I'm, I'm willing, I can keep learning, I can keep growing, is there something I can do differently? I, I can't play out every scenario, but you get the idea. Your gentleness is known to man when your requests are known to God. Think about these outbursts in your own life. When you've had outbursts of anger, controlling behavior, harsh words, arguments, unreasonableness or rigidness, what is really behind these kind of outbursts, I would say they're, they're a cry for help. When I, saw, I see someone blow their top and just lose control, I feel bad for the people on the other end, but I also feel bad for that person because I know the reality is they're crying out for help. They just don't know where to find it. That's why they're exploding in that moment. That's why they've lost control. That's why they're not experiencing gentleness is they don't even know what to do. They're so lost in it all. And so the encouragement this morning would be if, if you struggle with that, stop crying out for help from others and cry out for help from God. We find joy when we come to God with thanksgiving and we bring our requests to Him. We operate in gentleness when we constantly bring our requests and our needs to Him. Cry out to Him. He's the one that can do something about it. So what, what are your needs today? Think about it. What are your needs today? What's going on in your life that's causing anxiety and stress and pressure and, and worry and all that stuff? Because if, if you don't cry out to God for those things, they're gonna build, right? Like a bottle with a cork on it, the pressure's gonna build and build and build until something explodes and you won't be operating in gentleness. So if we want to walk in God's way, we have to make some decisions. And so think about what is the need in your life today? And now let's put those on God. Put them on God. Whatever it is, just take a moment. Your own, your own moment with the Lord. He's right here. He's not far. He's close. God, I need you in this situation. Maybe you'll fix it. Maybe you won't but you'll sustain me, you'll give me strength, you'll enable me to make it through because you've done it before, you'll do it again. God, I really need a miracle. I really need some help. 
I don't know where else to turn, but I'm going to put it on you. I can't carry this weight. As we do this, as we practice this, the Lord is near. And the Lord is for us. The Lord will help us. What are your needs today? Put them on God. Let him carry them so you can experience joy and be one of, one of those people who is known by all for their gentleness. Gentleness, again, is the fruit of the Spirit. You can't experience the fullness of gentleness in your life apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. So it's about proximity. It's about connection with the one who gives these gifts. Are we walking with the Spirit? Are we staying in step with the Spirit? Or are we over here doing our own, own thing? Because if we're just doing our own thing, we won't experience what the Spirit wants to do. Let's walk in step with the Spirit. Let's go the way that God has laid out for us so our hearts and minds can connect to Him. Would you stand with us as we just get ready to kind of have a corporate response this morning? I was kind of blown away as I studied for this and prepared for this message. What Gentleness just it didn't excite me at first. But man... I begin now as I understand it more and more through God's word, I begin to understand that if we as a church became people who were known by all for the gentleness, that in itself would change our community. That in itself would, would draw people to the Lord. Pretty powerful stuff. But before we can impact others, it has to be right here. We have to think about where we're at. And so today, I would say today's the day. If you, if you need to be more gentle, today's the day. Today's the day to, to get on the path that God has for you. Today's the day to, to crucify these old ways, to stop these old ways and start some new ways. And so let me lay it out for you in just a three-step kind of, let's wrap it up here. Today's the day to give up the old, to start the new. So here's, what we, here's where we do it. Step one, you have to belong to the Lord. Until your life belongs to the Lord, Jesus Christ, you're on your own. And we all know how that works out. Not very good. You have to belong to the Lord. And so if you're here today and your life doesn't belong to the Lord, you haven't surrendered to him in his way yet, this is the moment. And I encourage you right where you're at not to hesitate, but just surrender your life to the Lord. Pray. Pray a little prayer. He, he, he can hear you. He can see you. He knows you. He knows the, the innermost parts and so it's that, it's that simple expression of, Lord Jesus, you are Lord, you're in charge, so you're in charge of my life, and I surrender, I surrender to you. That's where it starts. The second step is to make a conscious decision to stop going the old way. My prayer earlier this morning was, God, help us to see the old way that we've still been operating in. And it's such a normal habit for us that we don't even recognize how wrong it is. But I have a feeling today that some people have recognized some things. We've recognized that's not the way I'm supposed to be going. That's the old way. I have been made new through Jesus Christ. Make a conscious decision to stop that and now start doing what God has told us to do. And it will be absolutely amazing. I am super excited because I know that some of you are going to take this serious today. You're going to take Jesus serious. And you're going to come back and you're going to say, you wouldn't believe the change in my home. You wouldn't believe how much this changed the dynamic in my marriage. You wouldn't believe what just happened in a conversation at work on Friday because I'm experiencing what it is to walk in, 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 the, in the, the fruit of the Spirit of God. So I want to just pray for us, and I would ask that you bow your head, close your eyes. Why? Because this is what we do. I don't know. Just kind of take a moment for yourself. And I want to ask you for something to take an action. The action is going to be to step out from your section and to just make your way forward to the front, nothing weird, but I wanna just meet everyone down here that's interested in this. I just wanna pray for you and it won't be long, but there's something really powerful about taking an action step, a public thing. And so today, if you 
if you are recognizing that you need more gentleness in your life and you want to embrace the way of Jesus and you want to walk in step with the Spirit, you want to say no to the old way and start some new way and experience what it is to be someone that is gentle, that is, that's so obvious to everyone else, I want to invite you just to come to the front and meet me down here. I'm just going to step down here and I just want to pray with anybody who says, that's me. This is not like some super specific special thing. This is just what God has for us today. And if you're interested in coming to the front, then come on down here and we're just gonna pray together. We're gonna make this, this step because it doesn't, we don't stop doing things until we decide to stop doing them. We don't experience God's new way until we make a decision to walk in his way. Is there anyone else? Come on down as we begin to sing this song. They're gonna lead us. And we're just gonna spend a few more minutes responding. Make me 
If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything more of you. If more of you means less of me, take so grateful that we are not on our own in this life. I'm so thankful that it's not up to us and our strength, our knowledge, our abilities, but, but that God is for us. Because without that, this would all be a, a waste of time and absolutely futile. So let's just celebrate one more time God's goodness in prayer. God, thank you that you are with us, that you are not far, but you are near. We thank you that you do not leave us alone but you are available. Thank you, God, that you sent your son to die on a cross for our sins, that those sins that once separated us no longer have to separate us from you, that we have access to you, our Father. Lord, I pray that you will continue the work that you have started and that you will bring about that work to completion. Lord, we know that you are working even when we don't see it, even when we don't understand it. God, help us when we become weary of doing good, not to give up, but continue to trust even in those moments, and we will see the fruit. We will see the harvest. God, we will see you transform our lives and make us like shining stars to those around us. God, we thank you for your goodness, for your faithfulness. We thank you, God, that when we leave this building, you are with us. God, you are so good. We honor you, we praise you. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for being here this morning. We are going to finish out the service now. You're free to go. If you did bring tithes, offerings, missions, any of those things, you can give those gifts at the back wall there. You can give online. Uh, but thank you again for being here. Don't forget, Connie Mack is next Sunday, so we won't be here. We'll be there. You guys have an amazing week. <laughs>